and welcome to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, your weekly dose of the top pro-life news and issues, all from a Catholic perspective. I'm Catherine Hadro in our Washington, D.C. studio. Thanks for joining us. Pro-life Catholics pray for faith, life, and peace in the British Isles. Actor Kirk Cameron opens up to us in an exclusive interview about what it's like to be pro-life in Hollywood and this. That's right, there you go. Yeah. Honoring Alfie. We look at how the British toddler's short life stirred a giant debate on parents' rights and care for our most vulnerable. But first, our top story, more than 150 members of Congress and 85 pro-life groups are calling on the Trump administration to stop funding abortion businesses like Planned Parenthood under the Title X Family Planning Program. In separate letters sent to the Department of Health and Human Services, members of Congress and pro-life groups are requesting new rules for the Title X Family Planning Program. Right now, Planned Parenthood, the nation's largest abortion provider, receives nearly $60 million a year from that program. Pro-life leaders say the Title X regulations need to direct funding to locations that do not perform or refer for abortions. And it's a call stretching beyond Capitol Hill. This past weekend, more than 5,000 pro-lifers rallied across 40 states at protest Planned Parenthood events with that same message. The Title X Family Planning Program is Planned Parenthood's second largest funding stream. Our next guest is a leader on the Senate front and has written to HHS Secretary Alex Azar to change the Title X regulations. Senator Joni Ernst of Iowa joins us from Capitol Hill. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you very much. Glad to join you. Planned Parenthood, the nation's largest abortion provider, receives $56 million a year from Title X funding alone. First off, what's your reaction to that? Well, unfortunately, I do disagree with having taxpayer dollars going to uh, the, the country's largest abortion services provider. So uh, that's one of the reasons that I brought up the Title X Funding Congressional Review Act. It did pass. It passed through the Senate and the House and was signed into law by President Trump. Uh, and what that does is restore the rights ability to decide who should be those subgrantees for those Title X funds. They're not forced to provide those dollars to uh, the nation's largest abortion services provider, which is Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood claims their Title X funding mostly helps the low income and people who can't afford care on their own. But Senator, can you speak to the important role community health centers can play instead? Yes, community health centers are extremely important, especially in states like Iowa, where we have a very rural and a very economically challenged demographic. Those community health centers step up and they provide um, lots of services for families in need. They provide truly women's health services, which are uh, things that Planned Parenthood doesn't necessarily provide. So we are glad to have those community health centers and we would much rather see those dollars going to those particular centers. As a powerful pro-life woman, Senator Ernst, how do you respond to the talking point that defunding Planned Parenthood is anti-woman? Well, I always push back on that because there are so many avenues for women to receive quality uh, health care. And again, we have talked about community health centers, but there are other means that women can receive health care. And what Planned Parenthood does is not necessarily provide health care services. Um, so just one instance, they, they don't provide mammograms at Planned Parenthood, which is something that I would say is part of a routine women's health care. So I do push back on that. I think there are many options available for women and truly those that will step up and provide every service for women. Senator Joni Ernst of Iowa, thank you for your time. Thanks so much. It's good to join you. We are going to continue to delve into this topic with our next guest in studio, a trusted pro-life expert.
Marjorie Danen Felser is president of the Susan B. Anthony List. Marjorie, thanks for being here. I love here every day. It's so <laughs> good to see you. So, first of all, this is the first time you've had Senator Ernst on the program. Mm -hmm. What do you make of her pro-life leadership and what she just had to tell us? Well, I know her well. I love her. It, it's one of the few people that I can say she was an even better senator than she was a candidate. We've been encouraging our viewers the past few weeks to encourage their Congress members mm -hmm. to sign on to letters that Senator Ernst mm -hmm. and Senator Roy Blunt and Congressman Ron Estes sent to HHS Secretary Alex Azar. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us more what were these letters and yeah. what, what should our viewers know? This is huge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> on the heels of the failure to defund Planned Parenthood by just one vote mm -hmm. in the Senate and then really not being really able to get it through on a budget bill where we had to have a ton of votes. Mm -hmm. We have another pathway and that is just through the administration. That is through some Title X regulations. Title X is the family planning program. Mm -hmm. It's getting abortion out of family planning, which we, of course we know that that is not what that is. And it would, these regulations were Reagan regulations. They could be re-upped now by Trump. Bush didn't do it. He took a pass. He could have done it. He didn't. Mm -hmm. So these letters are all about, um, four, well, I'll just say 41 senators. It is hard to get five senators to agree on anything. 41 senators and 155 members of Congress from the, Cong from the House mm -hmm. have signed this letter asking President Trump to get those regulations back on the books. And what it would do would be to basically, the effect would be to in, end up defunding Planned Parenthood by about 50 or 60 million dollars a year. It's the second biggest source of funding that Planned Parenthood has on the national level. So it's really important, really big, r happening now. 85 organi uh, pro-life organizations all around the country have done exactly the same thing in a similar letter to the president. Everyone's really coming together That's right. for this. How hopeful are you the White House will take action? I think it's a moment to pray. Mm. I think the White House in general is very for this. I think he in general is for this. But it is not happening, and we are not exactly sure why. But we think that um, now our voices have been are, have been gathered, and they're being presented in a in a very compelling way from all parts. Mm -hmm. um, it's so important for the Senate elections coming up in November that this happen. So I'm I'm cautiously optimistic, not to overuse a overused term, but that mm -hmm. is how I feel about it. Yeah, we'll, we'll continue to monitor that. And now, before yeah. I let you go, mm -hmm. this week. After 12 years as president of Planned Parenthood, it was Cecile Richards' last day. Mm -hmm. What will her legacy be? I think of her, and I think there, but for the grace of God, I could have gone. I was very similar to her in my own leadership. You know, she was a strong, she's been a strong leader in the wrong direction. All these beautiful mm -hmm. skills that she was blessed by God and use them to undermine women, un use them to abort much of America, mm -hmm. much of our future. All these children that we needed, she was a part of running a business that it was their business to eliminate. She doesn't understand that, I know she doesn't, and yet that is the effect of her leadership, that is her legacy. Let's continue to pray for her conversion. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Marjorie Danen Felser, president of the Susan B. Anthony List, thank you. Thank you. Planned Parenthood, the nation's largest abortion provider, receives a massive amount of taxpayer dollars. Their second largest source of federal funding specifically comes from a family planning grant program called the Title X program. From that program alone, Planned Parenthood receives nearly $60 million a year. We know this and we want to do something to cut this funding off from the abortion giant. Are you with us? If so, follow this week's call to action. Go to your computer, open up your internet browser, and type in ProLifeWeekly.com. Again, that is ProLifeWeekly.com. Here, you can send a message straight to the White House, asking them to direct the Department of Health and Human Services to make a change in Title X regulations so Planned Parenthood is defunded. This taxpayer funding stream needs to be redirected away from Planned Parenthood and other groups that refer for abortion or perform abortions. This approach of defunding Planned Parenthood of Title X funding works. We know because President Ronald Reagan did it before and the Supreme Court upheld it. 
Now, let's tell President Donald Trump to take that same action and direct the HHS department to make the change in the Title X regulation. It's time to defund Planned Parenthood. You can take action and send this message to the White House by going to ProLifeWeekly.com. Again, we're asking you to take this simple step and send a message at ProLifeWeekly.com. We go now to pro-life headlines from around the globe. Y durante un minuto, 60 segundos, nos mostremos en silencio, recordando a cada uno de ellos. Pro-lifers remember abortion victims with a minute of silence at Saturday's March for Life in Mexico. Mexico's Legislative Assembly of the Federal District legalized abortion until the 12th week of pregnancy in 2007. And since then, about 194,000 unborn lives have been killed. Saturday's pro-life march in Mexico drew a crowd of approximately 22,000 people. Organizers told the marchers to realize they are not alone in upholding life. Pope Francis calls on people from different faiths, cultures and careers to care for the sick and the suffering, especially the marginalized. The Holy Father's comments came at last weekend's Unite the Cure event at the Vatican with some 500 participants. Pope Francis also highlighted the need for ethical responsibility in the field of genetics, noting not everything technically possible is thereby ethically acceptable. And in what's believed to be the biggest UK Catholic gathering since Pope Benedict XVI's 2010 visit, thousands of Catholics prayed the rosary around Great Britain's coastline on Sunday. There were 400 registered groups across England, Scotland and Wales praying for life, faith and peace. One British priest involved told EWTN News Nightly it was like Our Lady was embracing the United Kingdom. What a gift the rosary is to us, especially in the month of May dedicated to Our Lady. Also in the UK, an update in a story we've been tracking for months. British toddler Alfie Evans died last Saturday, days after being removed from life support. We have an in-depth piece of little Alfie's life and death later on in the show. But right now, we are going to switch gears. On this show, we often share examples of how the abortion industry is closely tied with Hollywood. Planned Parenthood's former president literally appeared on the Oscars stage this year, for example. But we rarely hear from those in the entertainment industry speaking up in defense of life. Our next guest is an exception. Kirk Cameron first came to fame in the 1980s for his starring role on the TV sitcom Growing Pains. The television and film actor had a conversion to Christianity after holding atheist views in his younger years. The evangelical Christian now focuses on creating TV and film projects centered on faith and living out the gospel message. He is married with six children, four of whom are adopted. Kirk Cameron joins us now in an exclusive interview from Calabasas, California. Kirk, thanks for being with us. My pleasure, great to talk to you. You've been public that you have not always been pro-life. You've written it was a gradual process. Tell us about that process. I think as a father of six kids and four of my kids being adopted has certainly played into the growing love that I have for everything that has to do with the life of children. So uh, it turns out that my wife is an adopted child herself, so is her brother, and when we started our family, we decided that we wanted to adopt uh, a child, and so we adopted uh, our first son and then two little girls and then our second son and then had two natural born children, and I think about the fact that, that I have so much of a treasure in my family today and that none of them would exist if it weren't for people who loved life and encouraged uh, mothers with unexpected pregnancies to give birth to their children. My whole family was just one appointment away from not existing. And so as a husband and as a father, I've grown in my love for life and my appreciation for those who come up alongside moms and tell them you can do this. That really puts it into perspective. Kirk, why do you think it is with all of the information that we have on abortion and the truth about life, why do you think there are still so many people who don't consider themselves 
pro-life? What's the disconnect there? I think that that really does say a lot. I think at the end of the day, we're all pro-life. Uh, it's just that it's, it's usually our life that we want to design to be the best that we perceive it could be. So uh, sometimes that, inc that includes a pregnancy and other times it might not include a pregnancy. But at the, at the end of the day, my value system says that all life is precious. And, and I think that at the end of the day, when I talk with people who have been, uh, uh, who have received an abortion, people who are considering abortions, people who have chosen to give their, their, their children life, I think at the end of the day, we all know that life is precious, that it's a gift from God. You mentioned your value system. Here we are, we're speaking on the Global Catholic Network. Kirk, you're not Catholic, but you are a practicing Christian, very public about that. Can you speak more about how your Christian faith informs the way you view life and the sanctity of life? Sure. Well, as a Christian, I know that, that life is at the very center of my faith. And uh, this is a, a faith that ha has been passed down uh, for thousands of years to me by, by others who also value life. And at the end of the day, that's what Jesus said. He said that I am the way, I'm the truth, and I am the life. Uh, he is the resurrection and the life. He brings dead things back to life. And he does that in my heart. He does that in your heart if we turn to him by, in faith. So how does my faith affect my views on, on being pro-life, well, it, it, it affects it in a profound way because to be pro-life is to be pro-God. God is life. He's the source of life. He's the center of my life and my kids' lives. And so I think we should be doing everything that we can to protect it and to enhance it so that uh, we can help everyone come to a place of enjoying abundant life. You've transformed your career, Kirk, into now making films for the family. Can you speak about why that is important to you and the role the family in particular plays in the pro-life movement and into building a culture of life? So we hear the terms uh, uh, pro this, pro that, or anti this or anti that. And, and, and when I hear pro-life, I think, boy, that, that, that really ought to encompass everything from the, from the from the womb to the tomb, right? From the cradle to the grave. So uh, if I'm pro-life, that means I'm pro-baby, I'm also pro-mom, I'm pro-dad, I'm pro-lives, I'm pro-family, I'm pro-life because life is, is better than death. And so I've tried to focus my career and even my time off the screen on things that really promote life in the arenas of faith and family, and also uh, the kinds of values that produce freedom in our country. And I think they all go really nicely together. They're, they're all, they, they fit like a hand in glove, and they're all connected, faith, family, and the liberties and freedoms that we enjoy in this country to be able to pursue both of those things. You're speaking to us from Calabasas, California. How are you treated by others mm -hmm. in the film industry for your pro-life views and pro-family views, are you respected? I, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I, I try not to pay uh, uh, too much in, too much attention to uh, whether or not people like me. My view is I have a couple of people that I deeply respect. My wife is one of them. I have a couple of really close friends. And then of course, God. And if I can live my life in a way that is really for an audience of one person and look for the applause of heaven and have the respect of my wife and a couple of people that I know are full of wisdom and want the best for me and for my family, then I'm gonna take my cues there. And for our viewers who don't know, your sister is actress Candace Cameron Bure. She's also been very public about her pro-life views. Is this something you two talk about? And do you know how she's been treated in Hollywood for her stance? So my little sister, I have three sisters, and, and Candace is our littlest of, of, of the sisters. And she's had such a such variety in her career, and she's been hosting The View, and she's been make, she's the Hallmark movie queen now, and she has so, so many different uh, roles that she's been playing as a mom, as a wife. And, 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 and you know, I think Candace, from what I know, is, is, is well-respected in a lot of circles. And, 
and like I said earlier, there's always going to be people that like you, always going to be people that don't like you. And Candace and I like to talk about things that we that we share in common, and we share so many of the same values. Um, so I'm, I'm proud of her, love her, uh, love her commitment to the things that count, pro-life being one of them. And um, I'm sure you can expect to see more great things from her. She's a good girl. Coming from the mouth of a big brother, that's good to hear. Kurt Cameron, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Nice to talk with you. Have a great day. When we come back. Little Alfie Evans has died, but the impact from his short life will not be soon forgotten. We remember the British toddler and how he captured the world's attention. Stay tuned as EWTM Pro-Life Weekly continues after the break. Now women can perform their own abortions. And you know the strange thing, that we are so accustomed to the worst kind of sin that we don't even see it. That's EWTN foundress Mother Angelica commenting on the sin of abortion back in a 1998 broadcast. Welcome back to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Catherine Hedro. Mother's words are very fitting for this next story. By now, many of you have probably heard that disturbing comment on abortion made at the recent White House Correspondents' Dinner. It's a comment so coarse and crude, it requires a response. Take a listen to what so-called comedian Michelle Wolf said at the Black Tie Affair. Mike Pence is also very anti-choice. He thinks abortion is murder, which first of all, don't knock it till you try it. <laughs> And when you do try it, really knock it. You know, you gotta get that baby out of there. That is wildly offensive. And we can assume Wolf knows what an abortion truly is because she literally referenced a baby, not a clump of cells in her routine. While comics strive to cross the line and push boundaries, that was not humor. Wolf's performance was the culture of death on display. Bishop Robert Barron recently responded to the remark himself, writing an indicator we're living in a throwaway culture is when people in tuxedos and formal gowns are sipping from wine glasses and laughing while someone jokes about the murder of children. We cannot stand for this. But you see, when you legalize abortion and call it freedom, when you promote killing and call it a choice, the consequences of these sins will build up and blind us. The lies will become entangled and the humor, therefore, will be twisted. But we cannot become accustomed to sin. We cannot be silent in the face of sin and we absolutely cannot laugh at it. Let us, my EW10 family, be a light and show the world what joy really looks like and that it doesn't mean making jokes about killing the unborn. Remember, there is a role you can have at home to counter today's culture of death. Contact the White House and tell President Donald Trump to direct the HHS Department to make the change in Title X regulation so Planned Parenthood is defunded of $56 million a year. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com. For the past few weeks, people around the globe have held their breath watching a little boy. Alfie Evans, who lived most of his 23-month-long life in the hospital with an undiagnosed degenerative neurological condition, died last weekend. This week, we look at how the British toddler captured the world's attention and started a conversation about what death with dignity truly means. There he is. Say hello to all your army members, Alf. British toddler Alfie Evans spent a majority of his short life inside hospital walls. And his young parents, ages 20 and 21, spent a lot of time within the courtroom. Alfie Evans had an undiagnosed degenerative neurological condition. Doctors treating him at Alder Hay Children's Hospital in Liverpool claimed the boy had little brain function and any further treatment would be futile. His mom and dad, however, disagreed and fought to take him to another hospital for further diagnosis and treatment. But after months and months of long legal battle, 
the British courts ultimately sided with the doctors. Top bioethics expert Wesley J. Smith summed up his alarm with the case here. In Alfie's case, there is no diagnosis. There is no surety that, that Alfie is dying. He has a profound cognitive disability. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're basically saying, well, that's not a life worth living. And if you think so, parents, even though you found another hospital to take him to for treatment, we're going to stop the treatment anyways. Alfie's story sparked worldwide outrage, with more attention tracking in recent weeks. Brazilian bishops created a video to support Alfie's family. Poland's president tweeted, Alfie Evans must be saved. And an independent member of the European Parliament jumped in to defend Alfie's parents, citing his Catholic faith as the reason. This family is also, is also Catholic, and they have a right to life of their child. They have a right to ensure that they do all they can to try and save this child's life. And that, I believe, is fundamentally part of our religion. The situation in Britain didn't go unnoticed by the leader of the Catholic Church himself. Alfie Evans. Alfie's father, Tom Evans, met privately with Pope Francis in the Vatican in April, asking the Holy Father for asylum in Italy so Alfie could be moved to Rome's Bambino Gesù Hospital for treatment. After the meeting, Evans sounded hopeful his son could make it over. He is amazing because he's got this undiagnosed brain disorder and he's having these seizures and still he's there fighting hard every day. Italian officials granted the citizenship request, but days after the Vatican meeting, with permission from the courts, Alder Hay Children's Hospital withdrew the British toddler's life support on Monday, April 23rd. Though he was expected to live only minutes, Alfie breathed on his own for hours. Doctors later administered oxygen and hydration and then nutrition after the boy went almost 24 hours without food. The world watched as little Alfie continued to surpass doctors' predictions. We love you, Alfie. We do. But then in the early hours of Saturday, April 28th, the British boy, just shy of two years old, died. Many were quick to know Alfie's death coincided with the feast day of St. Gianna Beretta Mala, the patron of mothers, physicians, and unborn children who died choosing to give life to her daughter instead of having an abortion. Coincidence or not, Alfie's short life created an international conversation about the dignity and care of every human life. It's an impact that stretched far beyond hospital walls. That brings us to the end of this edition of EWTM Pro-Life Weekly. Thanks for being with us, and I look forward to seeing you here again next week. Until next time, you can reach us at prolifeweekly at EWTN.com with any questions or comments you may have. And remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.